Welcome. I'm glad you're here. I'm thankful to share this space with you. Since you're here, let's get this work. My name is Elijah Gann, educator by occupation, father by choice, black on purpose, and a man through my actions. I'm here to show how I use poetry, meditation, and hard work to channel my aggression into the actions that help build my dreams. Now, all my dreams aren't big. Some of them are simple, like making it through the day without flipping out or being so scared that I won't have enough money or food for myself or my family that I let my fear manifest into anger. I choose to seek knowledge because I won't let self-destruction be my downfall. I know for certain that the rage I feel at times is just as much of a strength as it is a problem. I know that if I don't have an outlet for my feelings and thoughts, that I will explode. It's guaranteed. And more times than not, that explosion hurts the people that I love, whether it's directly or indirectly. I'd like to recap what I shared in my last video, share a piece that I wrote, and discuss how writing something directed to a specific audience can help you hone in on what is truly bothering you and separate the righteous anger from the self-destructive rage. I shared in the last video that our reactions to things are usually more deeply connected to something that is going on in our lives. I shared that if we find ourselves repeating a word regularly throughout the day, then there is power in writing that word down and then just free writing everything that comes to mind about that word. If you have not done so already, take the time to reflect on a word that you say repeatedly throughout the day, whether on purpose or on accident. Put the word at the top of a sheet of paper, set a timer or watch a clock and just write for five minutes. Try not to pick up the pen or the pencil and just see where the writing takes you. Don't worry about spelling or grammar or sharing it with anyone else. Just write stuff down and see what happens. If you are unsure where to start, talk to someone you trust and ask them if there is a word or phrase that you repeat a lot and then go from there. I choose to write poetry because it gives my writing a flow that matches my lifestyle. You can listen to my poems and see the way I walk and the way I talk. My writing matches the rhythm of my life. On your journey, if you find that you are repeating something negative or self-destructive, use the visioning process you have begun to help train yourself to replace that word with something more powerful and productive. I am a firm believer in the greatest fear we have is not that we are failures, but that we are powerful beyond our wildest dreams and that that power is so great that at times we shy away from it and hide in our fear of success through self-destructive behavior. Feeling things is human, yet what we do with those feelings is something we have control over. Take some time to engage in a free write and explore where that writing takes you. I've also shared about my experience with entering college and how that connected me to a vision I had developed of myself and what I wanted out of life. I shared while in college, I began to meet people who had similar life experiences as me. I'll start by saying, I've never claimed to be a gangster. I've never joined with a group. I've always had my crew, that is my close friends that I spent time with. I've always had my extended family, that is those people I've known for so long and been through so much with that they were like brothers and sisters to me. And I've always had my family. That doesn't mean that other people I know didn't walk a different path. It just means that that's not the road that I walked. It never changed where I was from or who I am. It just changed how I represented that and how I stayed connected to it. Moving around as much as I did caused me some problems with being accepted by people, but it taught me what I believe makes up the true qualities of friendship, and I've held on to many of those friendships over the years. While in college, I told you, I failed my first semester and then almost failed the second one too. As the second semester began, I began noticing something huge. Most of the people that I was hanging with in the first semester that I had arrived at college with had already quit. And the more we engaged with the school we were going to, the more we found ourselves uncovering that there was not really a place for us there. My writing continued and with a good buddy of mine, we started a newsletter called E&E. 
We used my buddy's printer in his room and we started printing a newsletter that was filled with our poetry. An older student on campus, the then president of the Black Student Association, recruited me to help start a newspaper. I had never been a journalist, never had a desire to be a journalist, and had no training with the technicalities of the profession or the technology used to produce a paper. I will not say that I was an expert writer and I was the best editor of that paper. I will say that I was committed to putting out a product and that committing to putting out that product helped give me space to create beautiful things. I did know that in the vision that I have of myself, I wanted to put my thoughts out there for other people. It felt like everything we saw in the news around campus and on the TV depicted the worst side of people and identified criminals as these horrible people who didn't care about anyone. That was something hard for me to accept because of the choices I had made and because of some of the choices that people were close to me had made. We weren't bad people and we weren't victims either. We made choices that when we look back on them were not the best choices and we caused pain due to some unforeseen consequences of actions we took. So I put in work and I started learning how to run a newspaper. During the next couple of years, I would find myself connecting with other young men who were struggling with these questions that kept coming up. A lot of the young men I was interacting with kept feeling this push and pull to be connected to neighborhoods that they were from while still trying to push themselves into a new place. And while working with professors and leaders around the campus, they, this question just kept coming up. Do thugs go to college? Not if there were thugs in college, but could you be a thug and stay true to that life and then still go to college and find success? I'll say that we never came up with some definitive answer and we didn't start some mass movement that changed the world. However, the young men that we were having conversations with and the people who connected during that time did find power inside in being who they were no matter where they were. As the editor of a newspaper, one of my jobs was to write an editorial piece for each edition that came out. I was living in Memphis and found myself observing hypocrisy everywhere I looked. I was finding trouble seeing the difference between some of the very successful people around me and some of the very successful people who were living an alternate lifestyle at that time. I couldn't see the difference between politicians, lawmakers, corporate executives, and the same people that were being identified as criminals in the neighborhoods that I grew up in. I knew there was a huge difference in those two groups and myself because I knew exactly where I was standing on my path and I knew that they were not standing near me. I sat down and I wrote an editorial called Why. This is the piece. Why. While puppet politicians such as Kwasi and Fume fight over the political leftovers, positions that America throws to them like bones for a dog, there is a real struggle going on in the United States. Vigorously, our nation's youth is in search of guidance and support. While our elected leaders look with a blind eye to prison and juvenile detention statistics and turn a deaf ear to the unreclined pleas of radical college students, the black seed of America is being swallowed by a desire to compete. Maliciously attacked and consistently ignored, once teenage drug dealers and petty criminals have turned into grown men, and not only grown men have they become, but fathers also, with several generations of children following in their footsteps. What happened? Did Dr. King's millions of followers get shot the same day as he did? While several great men died by assassination and others died from bully brutality, several, several of the civil rights leaders we know so well from our past now happily enjoy the fruits of dead men's labor. Sitting at the bottom of Capitol Hill, men would have the nation's minority youth believe that they fight for us and that we are all a part of the same struggle, while it is highly visible that mainstream politicians and expansive organizations have lost touch not only with the community and with the people it represents, but these organizations and their leaders have simply lost touch with reality. It is reasonable to believe that a politician within I'm sorry, is it reasonable to believe that a politician with an African name or a minority politician in general would be a champion for civil rights and the minorities whom they represent? So often this is not the case. While former civil rights activists cruise around in Mercedes Benz while seated in the presidential chairs of various uplift organizations, 
Children idolize the dope dealers in their neighborhoods who drive the same cars. Often rap music is shunned because of its violent message and its promotion of drug selling and promotion of promiscuity, but why? Is it that our political leaders have matured beyond the point of being sexually deviant from their significant others, or are they simply throwing stones while living in a glass house? If the so-called talented tent will not take the time to lead the youth, someone will. While we mourn over fallen soldiers and pray for a change in the future, our youth is fighting for that change right now. While big name organizations have become faceless in urban communities, Tupac Shakur has become a household name simply by living the thug life he said he lived. Our youth is so impressionable. Those who come to college escaping the dreary confines of ghetto games and theatrics are forced to observe silver, silver spoon frat boys and Maybelline queen beauties play dress up and mimic the appearance of thugs on TV, not as they are in reality, but as they are on TV, not as they are in reality, but as they are on MTV and BET. While there is no consistent and persistent recruitment in low-income neighborhoods from uplift organizations, and while political candidates dance tight ropes with indirect and ineffective political speeches, the Crip and Blood nations start recruiting at age nine. While it may seem that Memphis has a gang problem, and while it may seem that some neighborhoods in Memphis are dangerous, take a glimpse at cities like Los Angeles, New York, and Atlanta. We tell children to be cool and stay in school but spend more on accessorizing for an outfit than we do on technology for their classrooms. We clap our hands and hoot and holler for politicians when they deliver dramatic speeches about nothing and commit millions of dollars to stadiums for recreational purposes, but never raise our voices to speak on the discrepancies between what city, state, and federal politicians say they're going to do and actually do. We sit idly by and watch as our nation is running to the ground and then tell kids not to join gangs or not to do wrong because these things have no future. When some of these things offer kids support, family, and jobs to a youth suffering from malnutrition. We condemn young men and young children for committing crimes while feeding our children forgetful bread in hopes that they will not remember that roughly 100 years ago it was legal for them to be sold like cattle and just 40 years ago it was illegal for them to attend the same school as their fellow countrymen. While the jails are being built and filled, we are watching and agreeing with 12-person juries that say children are evil. The streets are calling. Well, who else is calling? Are you? I shared some of my smaller dreams about making it through my day. But I'll also share with you that one of my larger dreams was to be a part of building a place that people like me could go to and receive an education and not have to change who they were to get that education. Having questions about justice, righteousness, and fairness are important for all young people and each person should be able to bring their voice to the table. What's right for some people might not be right for others. The important thing that we must remember on a day-to-day -day basis is, are we letting our emotions control us or are we controlling our emotions? Feeling things is human. But what we do with those feelings, that's up to us. Take some time. Choose a topic, something you believe in, something you're passionate about. Write that topic on a piece of paper. Select an audience and then write something directly related to those feelings and ideas you have. Take the time to write about something you stand for. Choosing a topic and writing about something you are passionate about and believe in can help you hone in on your righteous anger versus your anger and rage that exist when we lose focus of our vision and don't have an opportunity to give ourselves an outlet. I hope finding a purpose and writing about something gives you peace. Peace.